So now we've seen transition matrices and transition diagrams. And that's the part of a Markov chain model that describes what happens as we take each new time step. So that describes the transitions between our current states. The last thing that we need to talk about in Markov chains is the notion of the current state. And for this, we're going to use what's called a state vector. This is just a vector that represents the current distribution among all of the states at, at some particular point in time. And we will always be writing them as some probability or as a proportion of some underlying population. So I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. But to find the state after n steps, after n time steps, you just need to multiply the initial state by that transition matrix in different times. So whenever I write a matrix to the nth power, what I mean by this is just t times t times t and so on. And you would multiply it by itself in times. So that's what I mean by that nth power. I just mean multiply by t however many times you want to advance your time step. So for example, in problem six here, it says, Given this transition matrix and this initial state vector, what's the state V1 after one transition? So if I want to just take one time step forward, then I would take the initial state and I would take one time step by multiplying by t once. So every time I multiply by t, I'm going to advance the time step. So this would be 0 0.25, 0 0.75 times the matrix t. Now, maybe just to save time, I'll go through these computations um, on my own scratch paper rather than doing them here. So I'll just copy down what I have on my scratch paper rather than talking through the full computation. But just remember that because we're multiplying a 1 by 2 matrix times a 2 by 2 matrix, the resulting matrix is going to be a new state vector. So it will be a 1 by 2 matrix. So notice that state vectors are always row vectors. And this will be another row vector or another state vector. In this case, it ends up coming out to 0.375 and 0.625. So that's what we get as our new state. So let me, before we go on to the next example, let me point a couple of things out. Um, so one thing is that Notice that in the initial state vector, if you add those two things together, then you get one in total. So these state vectors are going to be describing the state at a particular time. This will be the state at time one. This will be the state at time zero. And here, um, you can imagine the state as meaning, so maybe let's call uh, A the first state and B the second state that these things can be in, that our system can be in. You can imagine this as being a probability where we're saying that at time zero, we have a 25% chance that we're in state A and a 75% chance that we're in state B. And then if we know the transition probabilities between the states, which are given by the transition matrix, then we can subsequently compute the probability of being in state A or state B at any later time. So in this case, if I wanted the probability of being in state A at time one, it would be this probability. You can also imagine these as representing proportions of people if we have some transition between different groups of people. So I might have 25% of people prefer restaurant A and 75% of people prefer restaurant B. If I then know the transition probabilities as these preferences shift, which I would use a transition matrix for, then I could compute what their future preferences are anticipated to be using the same method. So we'll use the transition matrix to take time steps forward. And the state will tell us either the current probability of being in each of the states, or it will tell us the um, proportion of the underlying population that's in any particular state. So let's do an example so that you can see what I mean. So here, a city is served by these two cable TV companies, Best TV and Cablecast. 
Due to aggressive sales tactics each year, 40% of best TV customers switch to Cablecast, the other 60% stay. And then on the other hand, 30% of every cable ca- or sorry, 30% of Cablecast customers in general will switch to best TV over the course of a given year. So in part A, we just want to write a formula for this transition matrix, and it's the transition matrix that we would use to find the state after five years. So we won't actually compute this matrix, but all that this is asking is if we wanted to take five time steps forward using this model, how would we do it? And the answer here is that you multiply by t five times. So that would be t times t times t and so on. Every time that you multiply by t, then you're taking one more time step forward. So we would multiply by t five times and Notice that we can write down the single time step transition matrix just from the initial prompt. So maybe let's use B and C to represent the two states. Those would be the best TV customers and cablecast customers. And we want to describe the probabilities of transitioning between these states over the course of one time step. So here, for the top row, we're transitioning away from B. So what we see is that 40% of best TV customers are going to switch to Cablecast. So that means that in the prompt we're given this 40% are going to switch from B to C, and that means that 60% are going to stay where they are. And similarly for part C here, or sorry, for row C, uh, we have that 30% of those customers are going to transition to best TV. And that means that 70% of them must stay. So as our final answer here, what we would get is the single time step transition matrix. But if we want to advance by five time steps, then we would need to raise this to the fifth power. And in order to do this, this is unfortunately not the same thing as just exponentiating each of these terms. This means this matrix multiplied by itself five times. So you would have to do five matrix multiplications to compute this. And that's why we're just going to leave it in that form. So that's how you would advance in um, or four or five time steps. Um, so maybe let me go back to example six for just a moment. Notice that so I mentioned that you can interpret these state vectors as telling you maybe the proportion of customers that exist in each state or at each company, or they could uh, be interpreted as probabilities, like the probability that you're in state A or the probability that you're in state B. Notice that multiplying by a transition matrix is going to again give you a new state vector. And that, that state vector or any state vector will have entries that sum up to one. So here, if you add these two numbers together, you will again get one. And that needs to be true of any state vector that we're talking about. So in all of the examples that we'll see, we'll be using state vectors that describe uh, proportions or percentages or probabilities, and therefore these numbers will add up to one. That can also give you a good way of checking whether you've gotten the correct answer. Because if you compute a new state vector and its entries don't add up to one, then you know that something has gone wrong. So let's look at part B here. It says, suppose that 25% of customers subscribe to Best TV and 75% subscribe to Cablecast. So this is out of all customers between the two. 25% of them subscribe to Best TV and 75% to Cablecast. And then the question is, after one year, what percentage subscribe to each company? And then what about after two years? So for this one, we know the initial state. So here the initial state is given by 25% are in state B and 75% are in state C. And now we want to compute the state after one time step and the state after two time steps. So first we'll do the state after one time step. So for this, I'm just going to take 0 0.25, 0 0.75 and multiply by the transition matrix that we had earlier. And I'm not going to scroll up, I'll just recopy it. So this was the transition matrix that we decided on a second ago. 
And if you compute this product, then what you'll get is 0 0.375, 0 0.625. I'd encourage you to check this on your own just to make sure that you're still remembering how to do these matrix multiplication problems. But this is what I get whenever we multiply. And th this is actually just the same thing that we already computed in problem six. So problem six is exactly the same state vector that we wanted. I just wanted to introduce you to that state vector multiplication a little bit early. So this is what we get as our proportion or what our percentage, maybe I should say, of customers that live at each of these companies. So 37.5% of them would subscribe to Best TV after one year, and 62.5% of them would subscribe to Cablecast. So Cablecast has lost customers. If we wanted to take one more time step, then we could follow the formula that we talked about earlier. So we could have the initial state vector times this transition matrix squared. because that would mean taking two time steps. But notice that what this means is that we're taking our initial state vector and we're multiplying it by this transition matrix twice. So we would have this and this. Unfortunately, I'm kind of running out of room. So this is what that square means. I'm just going to multiply by t twice. But notice that this first matrix multiplication is what we've already computed. This thing is just v1. So in other words, if you want to get from v1 to v2, you just have to multiply v1 by t again to take one more time step. So this would be the matrix that we just computed, which was 0 0.375, 0 0.625, that times t. So if you compute the product of v1 with t to take one more time step, that would land you at v2. And what I get as my answer for v2 is a 0.4125 and a 0.5875. Sorry, I'm squeezing this in. There we go. OK, so this will tell us the proportion of customers that each company has after one time step or after two time steps as we transition according to that transition matrix. By the way, whenever you're doing these problems, like I said a second ago, it's, it's good to check that these two things add up to one. Because if you have a state vector, its entries are supposed to add up to one. So that will be a good way of checking your answers here. Um, if you have long decimal expressions like this, and you need to check whether their entries add up to one. So if I wanted to know whether these things add up to one, then all that you need to do is you look at each digit. So this is just sort of an optional shortcut. You can obviously just plug this into a calculator if you want. But if you want to do this by hand, the way that I would do it is I would look at each digit and make sure that each digit sums up to nine in total with the exception of the last digit, which sums up to 10. So here I would get a 3 plus 6, which is 9. For the second digit, I would get a 2 plus 7, which is 9. And then in the last digit, of course, you want that to add up to 10. And as long as that property holds, these numbers, these two decimal numbers between 0 and 1 will add up to 1 in total. So that can be sort of a shortcut for um, either writing down the answer quickly if you don't want to check your work or checking your work quickly. Oops.